right, I'll start the recording. Um, so yeah, welcome to the second workshop of the Workshop Wednesday series with Women's Studies Online. I'd like to, as always, begin by thanking Cherry Smiley, who has spearheaded the Women's Studies Online platform all while doing her own research. And so I'm extremely thankful to be given this space to be able to talk about the history of second wave feminist print culture. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Beck Wonders, and I'm currently doing a PhD at the Glasgow School of Art in the history of women's, the women's liberation movement in Britain, and particularly the publishing arm of the movement, feminist periodicals, and the mediation of the conflict, feminist conflict through print. I co-founded the Vancouver Women's Library in 2017, and I'm a current member of Radical Girls. So, now that we've started, I'd like to begin here by, um, I try to begin each workshop by honoring my grandmother, Lillian Wonders, who you can see here in her garage printing press that she lovingly titled Wonders Printing. She printed on an 1890 Chandler and Price letterpress, and we used to spend our afternoons rifling through books on typography and design. She taught me a lot about letterpress printing and even more about the love for publishing, and she celebrated her 95th birthday last month. Um, so today's workshop will be on the topic of women's print networks during the second wave of feminism, dealing with the questions of how second wave grassroots communication networks connected the movement. Um, all of these slides, um, resources and recordings of today will be made available to you after the workshop. Um, the recordings might take a little bit longer because we're just waiting to get the Women's Studies Online website off the ground, but the slides I will send to you shortly after the presentation. Um, as I uh, noted during the first workshop, this is a telling of a history, not of history. So today's workshop is not meant to be comprehensive. It's a selective telling through my own lens what I think are interesting examples of, fem of feminist networks and communication infrastructures that can potentially enrich contemporary discussion of similar issues and also create intergenerational links between second wave feminist activism and similar concerns that are at the forefront of young women's minds today. So in this sense, I hope to provoke a sense of continuity between waves rather than understanding ourselves today as completely separate from previous feminist efforts. With all these workshops, I hope to show that the feminist archive, feminist printed material and feminist publishing ventures all make up a treasure trove of information on which to base inquiries into our histories. So women's pre-internet communication networks range from projects like the Women's Yellow Pages in North America, to magazine collectives such as Speak in South Africa, to feminist radio channels, such as the Feminist International Radio Endeavor in Costa Rica or FIRE, and the Federation of African Media Women in Zimbabwe, to indigenous theater groups such as Sistren in Jamaica. There's so many more hundreds I could mention, but for today I'll focus on printed networks, that is newsletters and magazines, in order to show through chosen examples how communication network thinking and communication network philosophy was integral to building momentum for the women's liberation movement, and also to the development of a woman-controlled communications infrastructure. Rather than arguing that these print-based networks should be revived in the same analogous form today, I want us to get thinking about the underlying ideology and strategies of creating network communication infrastructures for our shared feminist goals. I've used the following key texts to frame today's workshop on second wave communication networks. They're rich with information and scholarly analysis. So I suggest to anyone who would like to dig deeper to begin with one of these books or articles. And like I said, this will be sent to you after. So first I will briefly outline what is meant by feminist network theory. In 2000, Routledge published four A to Z international encyclopedias of women featuring comprehensive global coverage of women's issues and concerns, from violence and sexuality to feminist theory, edited by Cheris Kramere and Dale Spender. With entries such as indigenous women's rights, kinship and lesbian cultural criticism, it notably also featured a significant entry on networking. Such an encyclopedic entry relating to women's networks is indicative of the relevance that networks and networking have to women. 
The entry begins by framing women's networking activity as a way to mitigate socioeconomic his and historical isolation. The so-called so good old boys network has been in effect for most of humans literate history because men have controlled most of the public communications and information technology. Men have also controlled the private networks of communication and information under the economic construction of the individual entity within the business and corporate world, which allows co-optation of the masses through, through a structural father image. The entry goes on to say, that women net, women's networking has been constrained by the limitations imposed by the powerful, which usually can be described in socio-structural terms as patriarchal, hierarchical, and capitalistic. The result for women was restriction to domestic, private spaces, silent voices, and isolation, depression, frustration, and too often intentional abuse. The entry describes how women have historically come together through the interpersonal networks of domestic production, as, such as childcare, care for the elderly, or food production. Though not necessarily conscious of active networking, such exchanges between women become indispensable collective strategies for survival. Networking among women has brought individual empowerment through sharing information and knowledge in direct and mediated messages and channels, and through their discovering commonality of social, tr of social treatment and status. So as a method of counteracting forced political and social isolation, women's networks enable the discovery of shared common threads. In this sense, the authors say, that networking is what it sounds like, working the net, the web. We are all Websters and spinsters, according to feminist theologian Marie Dolly, and thus we are all networkers and are usually networking. Mary Dolly defined the network as a tapestry of connections woven and rewoven by spinsters and Websters, and that this carries with it the possibility for a new kind of feminist space, which is created on the boundaries of patriarchal institutions where women create real alternatives and presence. Such transformative possibilities were particularly well served by print media in the 1970s and 1980s, as women with little or no experience could still make use of the low barrier and inexpensive materials to start their own networking initiatives. In her seminal research of approximately 500 second wave US feminist periodicals, Martha Allen observes that when a woman working on an issue of concern in her life began communicating through print, she would discover that she was not isolated, but was part of a network. Annabelle Soberni Mohammedini issued a 1996 update to Martha Allen's study titled Women Communicating Globally, Mediating International Feminism. Importantly, she illustrates that women's communication networks are up against patriarchal media, um, which may be integrated with transnational capital at the global level, making money out of sexploitation or with repressive state formations at the national level, maintaining the socio-political and cultural gender imbalances. Thus, almost by dint of their existence alone, autonomous media controlled by women with women-defined output offer a challenge to existing hierarchies of power. When these media take up specific issues and campaigns and align themselves with larger social movements, their political potential is significant. Anthropologist and interdisciplinary scholar Pilar Riano Alcala edited a seminal volume on women and grassroots communication infrastructures in 1994. She observes that the recognition of otherness, so gender, race, and class, is achieved in grassroots communication through the dynamic building of group bonds, through identifying a common project, a sense of belonging, ours, and through the recognition of the participants as a collective subject, we. More than just being instances of alternative media, women's communication networks are a direct attempt to facilitate the recovery of female relationships and collective historical memory. The logic underlying alternative communications and feminist communications is that of social movements or the identification of a social project in which a variety of social actors seek to create a new social reality, a new culture, a new logic for all aspects of life. Rianyo adds important observations relating to the participatory and low barrier characteristics of women's communication networks saying that the conventional description of communication technologies identifies them as inaccessible, expensive, and complex technologies that require professional expertise and male gender technological abilities. 
women's participatory communication experiences questions this idea, promoting participants' use and manipulation of the technology. The process helps participants become critical of the technology instead of accepting it or taking its content for granted. Kate McKinney, whose research on US lesbian feminist newsletters and networks I'll get to in more detail shortly, says that the network is a conceptual model for imagining a kind of utopian feminist politic. Network stands in for an idea of what a large organized feminist movement could do. So now that we've hopefully had a sense of the underlying attitude of feminist network theory, let's think about specifically um, how it relates to print. Martha Allen's research on US second wave feminist periodicals details how extensive communication networks owned and operated by women during the 1970s and 80s included the forms of broadcast, film, video, and music. Most notably, however, was the distribution of feminist periodicals and newsletters, which Allen estimates includes more than 1,380 titles in the US alone that amounted to tens of thousands of individual issues. She says that the development of this network has been unprecedented in women's history. No past media by women have arisen out of so wide a representation of the public, nor contributed so much depth of issues and perspectives. As a result of this remarkable networking in two decades, hardly an area of life was without some periodical or other media voice of women contributing new facets of their lives to the collective understanding. These multi-issue and specialized media broadened and deepened the network building of women who constituted the women's movement. The immensely more accurate, more extensive, and more intricate communication networks now began to reveal the complexity of real lives of women. Communication networks were everywhere. They were the movement speaking. Joe Freeman, uh, who's the author of The Tyranny of Structurelessness and also widely known women's liberation activist, details how important a communications network is for the thriving of the women's liberation movement. She says that the need for a pre-existing communications network or infrastructure within the social base of a movement is a primary prerequisite for spontaneous activity. Masses alone don't form movements, however discontented they may be. Groups of previously unorganized individuals may spontaneously form into small local associations, usually along the lines of informal social networks, in response to a specific strain or crisis. But if they are not linked in some manner, the protest does not become generalized. It remains a local irritant or dissolves completely. If a movement is to spread rapidly, the communications network must already exist. If only rudiments of one exists, movement formation requires a high input of organizing activity. So this kind of early theorizing of feminist communications network networks predates contemporary internet thinking and in fact some say uh, is closely related. As Kate McKinney details, newsletters in the late 20th US lesbian feminist movement predate online communications media and the contemporary listserv but also use network communications to circulate information to geographically dispersed but politically organized individuals and groups. Even prior to the web, networks have been critical to the construction of feminist histories. Distributed primarily by letter mail, issues of these newsletters acted as communication infrastructures, publishing requests for information and resources, updates on the activities of others, surveys, phone trees, listings of archival holdings and primary source materials at community and institutional archives, mailing lists and bibliographies. Ultimately, McKinney argues in her own research on lesbian feminist newsletters that a feminist mode of network thinking can be traced through small scale print lesbian feminist newsletters that draw on the language and practice of networking. So she actually asked the question, did lesbians invent the internet? I mean, it's sort of a, a rhetorical question, but the thinking behind it is interesting because a lot of these small scale feminist newsletters embodied the kind of network thinking that we take for granted today, or that is embodied in a lot of Silicon Valley technology. Um, she shows that what is at stake is not merely the distribution of a particular printed material, but rather that the possibilities of feminists could imagine themselves as building networked media infrastructures. In the early 1970s, 
newsletters animated the idea that the women's liberation movement could be a unified national and international undertaking. Newsletters promised informational support for the pedagogical drive to recruit women into feminism via consciousness raising. A newsletter network promised to deliver specific goods, such as the recovery of women's history, but it also promised that feminism itself might carry on, taking the form of dispersed but networked communities united by shared interests and goals. The revolutionary vision of the women's liberation movement was nothing less than the complete upheaval of business as usual, flipping the world on its edge through the critical analysis of virtually every aspect of society. Referencing this enormous goal, McKinney says that securing a future for feminism is a massive undertaking guided by much smaller communicative endeavors achievable for a thriving print culture. Thus, a newsletter network grounds feminism's more to utopic visions in the modest pragmatism of ink, newsprint, stuffed envelopes, and stamps. Using a 1964 computer engineering model illustrating network communication by Paul Baran, McKinney characterizes feminist newsletter culture as operating somewhere in between a decentralized, so the middle diagram and distributed network, the right diagram, creating connections that transcend the limits of the centralized network diagram on the left, which is typically associated with print publications. Thinking about the significance of such networks for feminists, Martha Allen argues that the gain that women made in these two decades were made because women had a means by which they could exchange their experiences as well as debate and, and discuss alternatives. By their exchange of this information within and across media networks, they learned to include the great diversity of women's actual experiences in their thinking and actions. Thus, the communication networks among women provided the women's movement its strength to make substantial progress possible. Without these media, there would be no women's movement as we know it today. Drawing on Martha Allen's research is a recent foundational study from 2017 which evidences increasing interest in the specific format of the periodical and its use during second wave feminism, namely Agatha Bain's liberation in print, feminist periodicals and social movement identity. She outlines the purpose of the feminist periodical and says that periodicals served a number of different purposes, circulating information, building and reinforcing networks, creating an imagined community of feminists, articulating theories and telling women's stories. The publications co constituted sites where readers formed relationships with the women's liberation movement. In regards to the periodical network, she says that the role of periodicals in creating and sustaining an imagined community for feminism should not be underestimated. They allowed readers to see themselves as part of a much larger entity and to make connections with women on a local scale. Baines is highlighting the blurring of reader, writer, publisher distinctions and draws attention to how a network of periodicals allowed for the feminist vision to grow and for participation to be encouraged at all stages and places. She says that periodicals gave feminism a place in a very pragmatic way, telling readers where to find feminism and reporting on places where feminist events have happened and will happen. Publications thus created space in which feminism's existence could be imagined across different locales. In general, the feminist periodical not only documented women's history, but also allowed for women to envision the future of the movement. For the women's liberation movement in the 1970s, periodicals were integral to establishing this enduring presence, weaving a temporal and spatial fabric for feminism that allowed activists to experience a vibrant present moment, a sense of the movement's past and a vision for its future. So having now explored network philosophy in relation to print, it's time to look at specific examples of this occurring. I will begin with Kate McKinney, mentioned previously, who researched the US-based lesbian feminist newsletter Matrices and its function as a print-based network. Speaking to the origins of matrices, McKinney outlines that Julia Penelope collaborated with four other women dispersed across the country, Sarah Hoagland, J.R. Roberts, Susan Lee Starr, and Libby Bouvier to found matrices. Circulation increased to 800 women in nearly every state and seven countries by the newsletter's fourth year of publication. Distinctly, 
Matrices functioned explicitly as a network designed for sharing information and resources amongst anyone doing research related to lesbian feminism. Using various media, photocopiers, and mimograph, telephones, letter mail, and the newsletter itself, the Matrices network facilitated collaboration across space with people who were otherwise difficult to know about, let alone reach. The idea of a network thinking through print-based media is apparent from the first issue of Matrices, in which the editors write that we open what we hope will become a continuous dialogue and exchange of information, a network of lesbian feminist researchers working in the community and academia. Matrices hopes to facilitate interconnectedness amongst us so that we can work together, sharing information and resources. Matrices editor, Julia Penelope, explored networks and webs in her role as feminist theorist, describing lesbians' culture power to connect us in a way which defies the geographic and temporal barriers which separate us, using print culture and archives to weave together the strands of culture and memory into a patent history. Matrices was clear with its emphasis on the importance of information circulation, detailing in a 90, 1980s editorial that we need to share our knowledge and resources, including contacts, jobs, how and where to publish our work, exchanges about how we survive in academia or outside of it, offer of support to each other, mobilize to help lesbian feminists who are fired, or to know other lesbian feminist researchers we can turn to when we are having specific research problems. Other possibilities to serve as a liaison between researchers in the academia, so those who have access to libraries, laboratories, meeting places, and those working without such support. To share information about how our experiences in institutions, the courses we can offer, departmental colloquia we might be giving, which libraries have kind of what kind of information. McKinney also shows how network thinking was not just an ideological endeavor. It also affected the ways in which the newsletter operated and facilitated centralized and decentralized communication. Matrices asked each subscriber to complete a profile with contact information, a short biography, research interests, title of papers written and published, and information on how off prints could be acquired by other subscribers, current projects, and support needed. Published in each issue, these subscriber profiles presented readers with the possibility of communicating directly with other lesbian feminist researchers who offered or requested information that might be of value. Drawing attention to the ways in which matrices actively participated in the creation of historical records as well as historical narratives, McKinney concludes that matrices promised this future by promising a past or a past that would carry on into the future, provided information continued to circulate freely amongst the researchers producing this work. So having looked at this example from, from the US, we'll now move our attention to a more international example, namely ISIS International. And I promise it's not the ISIS that you would be familiar with today. Um, ISIS began when a group of feminist activists from different countries and regions working on the burning issues affecting women around the world started communicating with each other. They said, we saw a need to set up our own channels of communication, to link with each other, share our struggles and strategies and build support and solidarity. And so ISIS was born in 1974. We began a small collective of women gathering information from local groups and the feminist movement and sharing it through the ISIS International Bulletin and resource guides. We also organized some of the first international feminist meetings, all of this on a sh shoestring budget powered by the energy of women and feminists across the world. In a 1984 publication of their second Latin American and Caribbean feminist meeting, they outlined some of the principles which underlie the existence of their journal and bulletin. Um, ISIS International is a women's information and communication service, promoting communication channels amongst women around the world, strengthening women's networks nationally, regionally, and internationally, providing information and models of action for women who are organizing and mobilizing against the oppression of women, building links of support and solidarity amongst women's groups and organizing worldwide. Through the ISIS International Women's Journal, women around the world share ideas and experiences for mobilization and organization. The journal provides a channel for women to make contact with each other and build up networks. Each issue of the journal is produced jointly with one or more women's groups around the world. 
ISIS International has a network of over 10,000 contacts in 150 countries and a resource center with thousands of documents, magazines, studies, newsletters, pamphlets, etc., from all over the world on the issues uh, women are working on. So health, women's alternative media, development, transnationals, housework, childcare, tourism, violence against women, sexuality, peace, theories of feminism, and more. So I will now uh, play you a short clip uh, of a 30 minute documentary uh, dealing, uh, detailing the journey of ISIS uh, International. The clip uh, that I've chosen is about seven minutes long. So if for some reason you can't hear or see it, feel free to let me know in the chat and make yourself a cup of tea in the meantime. Um, so I will start playing it now. And I really do hope you get as much enjoyment as I did out of how dated this video is. So here we go. In the Third World, the 1970s was a period of liberation movements against military dictatorships, imperialist and neocolonial rule, and apartheid. Within these movements, women were not only fighting to free their countries, but also to free themselves from the shackles of patriarchy and sexism. As more and more of them recognized this double oppression of their ranks, women activists called for equal participation in national and social liberation. Despite their diverse social and political contexts, they all share the belief that women had to do something to change their lives. We grew out of the social movement at the time that was putting everything into question. There was this sort of whole wave of you know, the student revolution and we were strong, we were going to change the world and we were obviously incredibly naive but full of amazing energy and, and, and ideas. Communication and information were essential to liberation. But at the time, much of the information in mainstream media was irrelevant to women's liberation. Worse, their voices were constantly rephrased and their issues misrepresented. In Europe and North America, the feminist movement was depicted as ugly male-hating shrews who demanded sexual freedom. Progressive women's groups in the South rejected the feminist label because of media's distorted depiction of feminism. As women from both North and South started interacting in progressive third world people's movements, they concluded that the underlying issues of patriarchy and subordination linked women across the globe. Convinced of the political power and nature of media, feminists found their own space and channels to bring out the real issues. In 1974, Marilee Carl, Jane Cottingham, and a group of women in their 20s envisioned an organization that would help empower women by providing them with relevant information and feminist analysis, raising awareness of their similarities and diversities around the globe, and linking up various groups that advance the women's empowerment agenda. They took this idea to the first International Feminist Conference in Frankfurt, Germany in November 1974. We actually had a working group during this Congress to talk about the idea of ISIS, uh, to see what kind of reaction we got, to see what ideas people had, and, and basically um, it was very exciting because people said, oh yes, this is absolutely needed. Um, and we felt incredibly encouraged. We felt, yes, let's go ahead with this, with this idea. ISIS was born, an organization named after the Egyptian goddess of creativity, knowledge, and wisdom. ISIS was originally located in the north, in Geneva and Rome. 
for very practical reasons. The founding members were based here at that time in the 1970s. Communication was much easier through Europe than in other parts of the world. ISIS gathered and disseminated information through networking among women's groups. The heart of a resource center began to grow. In March 1976, Brussels hosted the first International Tribunal on Crimes Against Women. The tribunal was a landmark event for the women's movement riding a feminist wave. ISIS launched its ISIS International Bulletin at this tribunal. Some 1,500 documents were processed and select testimonies and reports were published in the bulletin. The all-women publication came out in record time at the end of March 1976 and was released in English, French, Spanish and Italian. There were no personal computers then, only typewriters. It was very important to us and we used this typewriter to actually, you know, type out the the text for the for the bulletin and we, we cut it, literally cut with scissors and pasted uh, to make layout and, and, um, and that's how we did the first bulletins. Copies of the bulletin were sent to women worldwide and soon after they began responding by mailing their own publications, handouts and posters and asking for more resource materials. The bulletin began to appear regularly and focused on various issues that women were organizing around different parts of the world. ISIS also produced Bottle Babies, a series of articles on the baby food issue that later became the subject of a worldwide campaign. Several Chilean women in exile in Rome joined ISIS Rome to coordinate with its contacts in Latin America. Soon after, ISIS started a Spanish edition of its bulletin. In 1976, ISIS began coordinating the International Feminist Network, which had been established at the Brussels Tribunal to draw aid and solidarity for women victims of crimes and injustice. The network was a channel for mobilizing international support, where country representatives could put out appeals for solidarity which ISIS then transmitted to its network for action. All right, so I'm sorry that that didn't work for everyone. Um, I hope uh, most of you were able to see that. And if not, um, the link to watch it is here in the slides. I just love the, the pan flute music and the, the transitions. It's so perfect. Um, so um, as described in one of their bulletins, unlike direct communication between individuals, the media offers a one-way only communication, rendering its readers or audience passive participants. It's not an exaggeration to say that there's no neutral media. Most of the news and information in the world is owned and controlled by the Western transnational news agencies. So for the movement to grow, it is absolutely vital that women should be able to communicate with each other and with the world at large. As a first step in overcoming the problem of the traditional media, women have started to create their own alternative media systems in different parts of the world, their own publishing and printing houses, newspapers, radio and television programs. The ISIS bulletin itself is one such initiative and we bring regular news of these developments. So moving on now to another international example, let's take a look at the International Lesbian Information Service or ILIS for short. ILIS was an international organization which aimed at fostering international lesbian organizing, largely based around the publication of its newsletter and organizing of conferences. Initially, ILIS was part of the International Gay and Lesbian Association. However, in Turin in 1981, Criticism concerning the lack of visibility of lesbians in the gay movement, as well as the cost of participation for lesbian act activists 
to the association conferences led to the separation of ILIS from the International Gay and Lesbian Association. The headquarters of ILIS rotated between Amsterdam, Helsinki, Oslo, Geneva, and again Amsterdam. Speaking to the intentions and editorial strategy of the newsletter, ILIS ILIS's secretariat wrote in 1981 that after some initial planning, we realized that this newsletter isn't intended to compete with lesbian magazines. That's why we don't have extensive articles on our pages. Neither are we able to compete with the big male dominated magazines and newspapers. These contain more news about important events and are published more frequently than we can manage. So please don't expect us to outdo gay news. So what are we going to write about and to whom? As we see it, our function is to write about whatever concerns us as lesbians and what nobody else is writing about. We want to form a link between lesbians in different countries. We want to reach out to women in countries where it is still very difficult, if not impossible, to live as an open lesbian. We have about 165 women or groups on our mailing list right now, and the number is growing. So in addition to their newsletter, ILIS also facilitated its network through dedicated phone trees. We are building a snowball telephone system. If an emergency action arises, every country is contacted as soon as possible. We hope to give you the full details of the next newsletter. Since ILIS relied on input from readers of its newsletters, messages like the following were very common, soliciting new submissions, but also instilling a sense of belonging into the reader. They said, we don't have any other income than that coming from you, lesbian groups and organizations and individual women. You are the only ones to help us to regain our resources. Nobody else is paying for lesbian information than lesbians themselves. Nobody else is spreading lesbian information than lesbians themselves. By 1987, ILIS had already organized over a dozen conferences. They detail their progress and effectiveness of their network, saying that during the past six years, we have built an internationally powerful lesbian network. The number of contacts has increased enormously. Having started as a group of not more than three, the ILIS has brought hundreds, if not thousands of lesbians together. So having looked at international examples, we'll now move to some examples from the United Kingdom. One of the most obvious examples of a women's liberation periodical that embodied network thinking is the Women's Liberation Movement National Information Service, or WLMNIS for short. Shortly after the first issue, it was renamed to Women's Informational Referral Inquiry Service, or WIRES for short. Um, they say WLMNIS is cumbersome. A Stockport sister suggests WIRES, standing for Women's Information and Referral Inquiry Service. What do you think? The idea for the newsletter first emerged during the 1975 National Women's Liberation Conference in Manchester. A summary of the conference appears in the first issue of WIRES in 1975, describing that it was clear at the conference that people did want WM LMNIS or WIRES to exist, and many sisters said their group would support the service and subscribe to the newsletter and also contact other groups in their area and tell them about the service. Because we were and are short of money and did not have a complete address list, we were depending on women's groups to publicize the service rather than attempt to write to all the groups ourselves. So clearly there were indications that an audience existed and was also willing to participate in the newsletter's dissemination. Wires was meant to act as a coordinator and information service provider for the movement and it was then agreed that a group of women in Leeds should set up the initial production. Wires featured regular sections relating to the women's liberation movement across the UK, such as conferences and meetings, campaigns, women's movement publications and newsletters, books and publishers, miscellaneous, news and financial reports, um, and much more. It later also included a regular letter to the editor page uh, in which women could write in suggestions, complaints and grievances and appreciations. In its early publications, we can follow some of the editorial difficulties and strategies being explored. In the minutes of their monthly meeting held in 1975 at the Chapeltown Community Center in Leeds, the forms of contributions for the newsletter were discussed. 
They said that groups should decide for themselves what they want to see in the newsletter about their activities and what is just for the files and arrange their contributions accordingly, not leave it all up to leads wires to decide. Leads may agree on a coding system for group activities to ease filing. Leads will send out a form with newsletters so that this info can be filled in more easily. Groups should send reports as far as possible in the exact word form they want to see published. Periodic reminders to groups and individuals will be sent uh, to send an info will be published in spare rib, timeout, etc. So not only was Wires creating an information network through its own readership, it also linked into other periodicals, periodical networks such as spare rib, broadening the web through which women would find their way into the movement. This excerpt also showcases interesting strategies of coding and filing systems that are necessary for any kind of information network. Another UK example, and this time it's a more local and small scale example of a print based network, is the Swindon Women's Network newsletter. The Swindon Women's Network emerged out of a group of women gathering to celebrate International Women's Day in 1985. The group met subsequently on the 20th of every month at the Workers Educational Association Women's Branch in Swindon. It was a loose collective of the different women's groups and individuals, individual women in Swindon. Out of these meetings came the idea of the Swindon Women's Network newsletter in order to distribute and share information from local women's initiatives. The newsletter was also meant for sharing articles from the different women's groups, letters, poems, stories, and drawings. In this way, we hope to keep all women informed of the activities of the women's groups in Swindon and to act as a forum for all women to air their views and ideas. So by regularly circulating this information amongst their readership, it ensured that women were unable, uh, women who were unable to attend the monthly meetings were still felt connected and involved. And in fact, the readership itself was largely responsible for bringing newsworthy items to the newsletter collective's attention. In a cry for help, which would later reappear frequently and not only in this newsletter, but in many others, the collective uh, addresses its readers. It says, we need more support. Send us articles so we don't have to spend vast amounts of energy just making sure there's something to go in the newsletter. Send us drawings, illustrations, so there's not a panic when we do layout. Send us letters of support or otherwise, and just tell us what it is you want from this newsletter. If you think an issue should be raised, raise it and help us with distribution. If you work in a public place, a community center, a library, a surgery, take some newsletters to leave there. So such a statement really indicates several things about the intent of the Swindon Women's Network newsletter. For instance, the divide between the newsletter and its readership was vague. The newsletter was a culmination of information sent in by its readers with the occasional editorial uh, and message from the collective. In this sense, the newsletter became a connecting agent through the production in and of itself. In order to put an issue together, women from the com committee and the readership had to communicate and connect with each other. This is also apparent in Swindon Women's Network newsletters call for help with distribution, asking readers to leave copies in their local public institutions. So such makeshift methods for circulation ensured that the readership could potentially see itself as an extension of and con contributed to the newsletter rather than merely a consumer of its content. In order to facilitate this alternative publishing ecosystem and to strengthen the links required to carry out its production, the newsletter features a contact list and a diary of local events at the end of each issue. This contact list was updated for each issue and included organizations such as the Asian Girls and uh, Asian Girls and Women's Groups, the Association Association for of Breastfeeding Mothers, Women's Media Group, Women's Therapy Group, and the Gay Outreach Group, and many more, all of which were local, of course, to Swindon. However, there were also clear issues with the representation of members within the network. As one reader, Eileen George notices, she says, we have, to my knowledge, no Black members. Where the elderly, the middle-aged, the youth, the lesbians of the network? So clearly the willpower of the newsletter collective was persistent in attempting to facilitate the Swindon Women's Network outside of its monthly meetings, but perhaps it fell short in relying too broadly on its readership for content and distribution without enough outreach into areas where unrepresented women would have encountered the newsletter. 
A final example of another small scale network uh, also located in the UK is Women's Links. Women's Links was a newsletter with the goal to follow up the actions on May 24th, 1987, which is International Women's Day for Peace, Justice and Disarmament. A women's gathering was held at Manchester Town Hall that weekend to discuss themes relating to women in war, followed by a women's disco dubbed Social Sapphos, and a subsequent women's trip to Capenhurst. One woman, Bridget, recalled the various groups present in Manchester that weekend, including Women Against Pit Closures, Nuclear Free and Independent Pacific, and Code's Casualty Ward Occupation, and Greenham Common. Bridget recalls her feelings of that day by saying, I felt hope, I felt connected, I felt the presence of all the women in the Pacific. Another woman, unnamed, said about the Manchester gathering that of particular value was the experience of sitting down again with about 50 other women with similar concerns and outlooks. So the emergence of this newsletter was in some ways a natural attempt to strengthen the connections between the various women's peace groups. On the back cover of the first Women's Links issue, the theme of networking is apparent. To the question, why make links, the newsletter proposes the following answers to be aware of a movement, to know and have sense of what, going, what is going on, to have more than the right on gossip networks, to be able to have efficient systems, linked activities, all working through a common interest. The newsletter also identifies significant isolation and alienation amongst women and between their campaigns, writing that a lot of ideas came from widening the web, but some strands seem to have snapped or been stretched a bit too far there seem to have been the linking of issues, but has this been to the detriment of women linking? By asking these questions in Women's Link's first issue, it is clear that ideas around facilitating a network between women and the, in the peace movement was at the core of the newsletter's purpose. More than just acting as a mouthpiece for issues relating to the women's peace movement, Women's Link seemed to act as a catalyst for women to communicate with each other. The front cover, cover reads that this is not just another newsletter and that it is planning to add a news section to the subsequent issue as a focus for discussion as well as a way for networking. There was clearly a felt need to stay in touch with women through some sort of communications infrastructure. Thinking ahead to issues of distribution, the newsletter makes clear that it has been duplicated on blue and white paper so that it can be photocopied and passed around. So this low barrier and in inexpensive material that make up women's links perhaps indicates a sense of urgency and practicality that is prioritized over any sense of preciousness about the printed object. Indeed, the timing of the first issue's publication was two months after the meeting in Manchester, enough time to reflect and strategize while also making sure that the concerns of women in the peace movement were still fresh in their readers' minds and any initial connections made at the meeting itself would not yet have dissolved. Clearly, Women's Links makes a strategic attempt not just to extend the physical meetings between women's peace groups, but to strengthen them and facilitate an engaged network through circulated newsletter. So now that we've looked at pre-internet feminist network thinking in relation to newsletters and periodicals, I'd like to draw your attention to your own contexts and circumstances. Having been informed by some of the examples today, I'd like us to think about the following questions. I'll just broaden my screen here. What feminists, uh, feminist networks do you belong to? Uh, how do you use feminist networks? What platforms, technologies are, you, are used to connecting your network's members? Is there a benefit to outsourcing these technologies? What could a woman-controlled network infrastructure look like today? How would a woman-controlled communications infrastructure impact the feminist movement? And what could be done in your opinion and in your own context to strengthen international communication between women's groups?